whether you are not a follower of Jesus, whether you are not, you know, this, that, or the other, it doesn't matter. I want you to be able to just feel like you belong, like you're welcome, like you're, you know, somebody's excited to have you wherever we're at. How do I keep growing to be able to share that with people to say, this is a safe space. Even if we mention Jesus, even if we mention Buddha, even if we mention nothing, it's a safe space. And how can we all inhabit it together? It's Uncommon Good, the podcast where we chat to ordinary people doing uncommon good in service of our common humanity. My name is Polly Reese. Fam, I am delighted to bring to you today Dr. Sandra Montes. If you don't know her, you should. She is the Dean of Chapel at the Union Theological Seminary in New York City and the author of the book Becoming Real and Thriving in Ministry. Quick content warning off the top. There is some explicit language in this episode. We do dig into Christian supremacy and white supremacy, self-image, and toxic masculinity. So if these are things that are not right for you to listen to, feel free, switch this one off, and we will catch you in the next one. We go on to talk about feminism, her philosophy of beauty and self-image, finding community across traditions of spirituality and faith, and the work of divinity schools and seminaries in shaping spiritual thinkers. Sandra is a brilliantly accomplished musician and a parent and a teacher. I was so lucky to get to sit down with her and chat about so many things. Please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Sandra. I cannot wait, uh, can, if you could hold it up to camera, but I can't wait to contribute um, I to the to well, the crochet so circle. I know, me too. Tell me the story about it. So um, I had a, I decided that I wanted to be with my family for my birthday, right? Of course, as usual. Yeah, yeah. And so I decided I'm gonna be gone, but I wanna do a chapel, you know, a service. So I did one and it was called Madre Femme, um, spirituality because I saw God as my mother. Like I saw my mother as God when I first, you know, I was a kid. So I've always thought of God as female. And then I see Jesus as femme. So, so anyway, so then, you know, I was like, how can I bring my indigenous spirituality, my family back to union? And then I said, Ellis, would you, you know, just crochet or knit something your son Alice. that then yeah my son Alice that then we can you know just continue on yeah and so he just started doing this so during the whole service he was you know crocheting it and so I'm really excited the 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 needles haven't come in yet uh, so we haven't because we had another uh service for you know um like of knitting and crocheting, et cetera, but we hadn't ha gotten the needles yet. So I'm looking forward to getting those so people can start adding to it. Yeah. Well, I am, I, <laughs> yeah, I'm a YDS grad and thank you, Yale. I'll, be, I'll see you tomorrow. Um, <laughs> but I definitely wish that we would have had a knitting and crocheting chapel because that oh, sounds amazing. I know, I know, I do too. I like, you know, one of the things, so I was talking to um, the student. Yeah. And, you know, she was telling me how she crochets and she knits, and that's one of those things that helps her keep focused. And so I said, you know, what's funny is that I, what helps me is being on my phone. You know, on my phone, I can be like, you know, playing, either playing a game that I don't have to think about or doodling or whatever, Right. but that is seen as negative. However, if you're crocheting, if you, if you look at people in meetings, if they're crocheting or knitting, nobody tells them anything. They're like, oh, okay, you're, you know, Absolutely. but if you're on your phone, it's like, uh, you're not here. You're not focused. And it's like the same thing, except we're doing different, you know, we're still doing something different, you know, I don't know. So, so anyway, so I was thinking about that and I thought, you know, that is one way of being able to keep focused and yet at the same time, you know, using your, your hands and, you know, to do something else. So, yeah, no, I, 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 t I 100% remember Exactly that. No, I, re I remember people 
people with the yarn the yarn crafts and i felt so jealous and silly me it's like well why don't you just start yourself right right and so you know i've started before but i'm i haven't really continued it's not one of those things that i i normal or naturally do ellis though he you know ellis my son does everything yeah so there's a point that I, I was thinking about. We just had had lunch with your chapel team, and they were l- lovely people. One of the pieces, topics of conversation that came up was um, disability justice in religious spaces, and this certainly seem, seems to me, at least certainly for me, now now that I am properly disabled, feels like a, a point of accommodation uh, because there there needs to be something to help with the fidget or what have you. I see so much of this sort of, and I, I might be putting the cart before the horse, but I see a common thread in your work with the Episcopal Church, now with Union, the writing that you've done, and we can pick whichever one that you want to talk <laughs> about first because there's so much to talk about. But I see this this common thread of making, and specifically for you since you are Christian, and if it's appealing, making Christianity, making Jesus accessible to everyone. And I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about why that feels or i i think that that's probably very important to you i think that's probably Mm. fair to say um yeah so i wonder if you can tell me a little bit more about why that is as important as it is that's so interesting that you asked that because i you know i love jesus that's one of i mean i love jesus as a matter of fact uh i think a summer like two summers ago i decided i'm done I'm done with Jesus. I'm done with the Episcopal Church. I can't with anymore. This is just, you know, so painful um, because, you know, I criticize the church a lot. I feel it's, you know, especially our denomination is so white. It's so it's like it doesn't want to grow like she just wants to stay the same or the people that are in it just don't want to change don't want to go outside of our walls right to to reach people not for the episcopal church but for jesus right for god to to know how much they are loved i feel like our denomination is incredible but anyway yeah there's this one crystallizing moment back in the 1960s where everybody just decided "Eh, we're good let's just keep it this way the entire time (laughs) exactly and then that's how it's been right (laughs) yes so yeah and so anyway so i so i had already decided that and then i heard presenting Bishop Curry um, preach. Michael Curry, Bishop Michael Curry, Royal Wedding, Michael Curry. Yeah, so all of a sudden I'm like, I can't leave the church. I love the church. And then I remember again, you know, like during almost near um, Holy Week, you know, thinking, all right, so this year, let me not, you know, because I love Easter. Easter for me is like the reason for my seasons. I mean, I love Easter. And so... I decided, no, you know, I let me just, you know, I'm angry at God. I'm angry at Jesus. Let me just leave it alone. And then I remember uh, I drove by this, like, uh, Stations of the Cross for immigrants. And I was like, I love you, Jesus. I love you so much. So you know what I mean? So it was one of those things. So anyway, so I love Jesus. I love the fact that I can get mad at Jesus. I love the fact that I, you know, I think and I will, I know that Jesus is alive. I know that Jesus is a lay person. I know that Jesus is queer. I know that Jesus is everything, right? So yeah. for me, Jesus is just accessible to me. And my parents did that to me. So yeah. I remember one of the stories that my mom loves to tell me or loved to tell me was, you know, she remembers when I, you know, because we would always pray before going to bed. And she said that all of a sudden one time we were praying and I was laughing. I was just laughing, laughing, laughing. And she's like, Mamita, you know what, you know, what are you doing? She's like, well, I'm just laughing with God. And so, you know, and I thought that's, that is exactly me. Like, you know, I sit here and I could be praying. I, you know, it's just one of those things that I just love Jesus. And I feel one of the best things that I have is Jesus. So I want to give you Jesus. And, and the thing is like, I know what it's like to be othered. I know what it's like to be looked down upon, to to be seen as, oh, you're not going to do anything. You know, you're brown, you're fat, you're this, you're that. And it's, and for me, it's like, but, but Jesus loves me, you know, but Jesus wants me. Jesus calls me. Jesus thinks I'm amazing. You know, Jesus, I'm Jesus's favorite child, you know, and so are you, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, it's like, I want all of us to know that, you know, and now throughout the years, I have also, 
I don't believe that this is going to sound, it's, it's, it's something that it's like a, a, I don't know, a thing inside me. I don't think you need Jesus to, to get to God or to get to heaven or to that special place. However, I feel for me, I love following Jesus. I love having Jesus in my life. Um, and you know, that's my way to get to whatever it is that, that happens, you know, in eternity, right? If there is an eternity, I mean, it's like, I also struggle with that. Um, but yeah, so for me, that's what's important. And I want it easier than it was for me, you know, like. I mean, I remember in the evangelical church, and I grew up evangelical. I remember I've always written music. I love to sing. And I remember that I was not allowed to sing my own songs when I was in the evangelical church. When I was, like, growing up, other people, men, had to sing them. So for me, I don't want that to be like that for you. You know what I mean? Like, for whatever reason, whether you are not a follower of Jesus, whether you are not you know, this, that, or the other. It doesn't matter. I want you to be able to just feel like you belong, like you're welcome, like you're, you know, somebody's excited to have you wherever we're at. And for me, you know, that mainly is, you know, in church spaces or in faith spaces because that's just my life. You know, I remember thinking, you know, when I was teaching, I taught for about 21 years and, um, you know, elementary school, K, pre-K to sixth grade. And that was my career. You know, that was my job. I did it very well. I was excellent. I loved the kids when I was there, but that was my job. My ministry is what I did and what I do, you know, in church, singing, you know, mentoring people, et cetera. That is my ministry. So, you know, some teachers, that's their ministry is being a teacher, right? Being, you know, a a pre, especially like pre-K and kindergarten teachers, I think they're like amazing. But, you know, but for me, it wasn't. So for me, it was really important for me to also understand that, that, you know, my ministry is something else. So my job is one thing and my ministry is another. And so, but at the same time, my ministry would go in to my teaching you know, during the, like when I would see kids that did not fit in for whatever reason, you know, I, for me, the ministry was um, helping them find their voice or helping them find their, whatever it is that they needed so that they could feel like they did belong, like they were welcome. Like it didn't matter that they're fat and can't run like I couldn't when I was a kid. You know what I mean? You can still be physically active and enjoy it like you can do other things you can dance you can you know what i mean like you don't have to run a freaking mile or you know what i mean like you can actually dance for a mile you know worth of steps i mean it's so so anyway so just those things you know it's and that was my ministry you know and i feel like that's still my ministry where i just want people to like i want it to be easy for you to get to for me it's jesus you know or god or whatever you want to call it, that divine spirit, creator, whatever. I want it to be easy for all of us to get to. Yeah. So, There are a couple pieces that I, I want to tease out and, and dig into a little bit more that you said that I think are at least uncommon, if not necessarily even a little bit into the waters of unconventional. The piece about whatever it is, whatever name you use for it, but the the thing that we're all, the thing, person, energy, entity, whatever language we use to be able to identify, what I think is the 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 divine, the thing that we don't do a good job describing in words because there are none, The piece of that, whatever that is, and the notion that a person can be a follower of the teachings of Jesus, participate in Christian community, churches, 
theological institutions of higher learning where we sit today. Thank you, Union Theological Seminary. Thank you, President Serene Jones. Thank you, Dean Kelly. Um, thank you so much for the for the space um, and for for bringing two two uh, brown and golden people into it. Um, but the the the, the sp all of those things together. But also, I know Christianity to be a pretty exclusive person. You know, like there's a lot of language in the space of Christianity that says. There is one way, there is only one way. And other ways are not only not true, but they're wrong and they lead literally to annihilation. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. So it feels very uncommon. It feels very, yes, unconventional to be able to say, if you do there there is the possibility for us to all be seeking that same divine presence that same unanswerable question that same profound whatever it's called even if we just don't have the same language for it and that that thing is still the same so i would love to hear after 15 minutes of preamble, <laughs> I, I would love to hear where the energy to be able to allow that freedom comes from. Yeah. You know, I, I have thought about that. Yeah. I have thought about, because sometimes I don't understand it either. Um, you know, I'm like, why, you know, why does, because I feel a lot of times I don't have that, like, no, it's this way. And that's the only way. Now I have that about some things, you know, but for some reason I feel like my parents did that to me. You know, my parents, again, we, you know, I grew up evangelical. I grew up, um, you know, um, what's it called? Uh, in Republican. I grew up, you know, when we got to the United States, of course, that didn't happen in Peru or Guatemala. But, you know, it's, I grew up in that kind of, you know, upbringing, you know, church, et cetera. And my parents were so open about everything, not about sex. Let me talk to the camera, not about sex. Like that was, you know, you were supposed to not have sex <laughs> until you got married. I mean, that has definitely, I mean, yeah, I follow that. So I've been married 158 times. No, okay. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, more or less. No, but, <laughs> oh, but they were just open about it everything like you know i hear horror stories about pre you know pks right and yeah. uh pastor's kids and you know my mom would leave breakfast for us yeah. and just tell us you know let us sleep through you know sunday morning wow. um you know just things like that that were just like not always i mean a lot of times you know when we were growing up and we were musicians etc i mean we had to help the family you know i mean so there were those times yeah. too you sure as fuck better not miss Christmas or Easter. Right. Or Three or, Kings Day. Or exactly. Or, you know, diff different things. Right. But but it but it was just this open mindedness about things. Again, in in the um conservative evangelical Christian realm, they were they're so open minded. You know, so one of the things that I have always known is that you can be quote unquote progressive and liberal and be very close minded. And you can be you know, incredibly conservative and be amazingly open minded, you know? Oh yes, yes, yes. So I've seen that my whole life with my parents. And so for me it's always been like, you know, I mean, you know, they my mom will tell you, I believe the word of God as it's written, but would never tell you no, you have to marry this person or you are going to hell if you're the, like they would, you know, my mom would never, ever say that to you, nor would she believe it. However, she will tell you she believes the word of God. You know what I mean? So it's like, so for me, I've seen that my whole life and even in my feminism or in my femme, you know, body, et cetera, what I always found very interesting in my family, my mom is super, super like the mom, the the Latina you know, serves my dad, you know, will serve him, you know, his food, his little snacks, takes care of him, wash. I mean, does everything, right? I mean, I, that's what I'm used to. Like, I'm never that mom, but that's my mom. And 
And yet I was never expected to be that woman, which I find amazing. Like I was never asked to serve my brother or my dad. I was never asked to be in the kitchen. I was in, you know, eating with the men, you know, and uh, with the elders, even when I was a little girl. So those are the things that I, it, you know, and that boggles my mind. And I've asked my parents, like, why did you raise me like that? You know, why would you in these, like in Peru and Guatemala, where it's super, super, you know, machismo and all stuff. So, and they were just like, because we love you and, you know, we wanted you to be you. So for me, I think it's that that's where it comes from, where I, I, I want people to feel that freedom. And again, it hasn't always been like that. I mean, you know, my parents make mistakes. I've made mistakes, but it's, it's that that openness and seeing my my parents grow throughout my life um of you know i remember when when we you know i was young and you know a, a man marries a woman that's it right. and when ellis came out to my dad you know that opens up my dad to other possibilities to the point where you know a couple of years ago i went home and i was like i just want y'all to know that i'm pansexual and poly so if I come home with male, female, you know, non-binary, whatever, y'all are just going to love them and be okay with me bringing another person home the next day. Like, you know, and so my dad's like just eating, you know, nicely. And have, my mom's like, of course, I already love them. You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, and my dad, I'm sure, you know, he's like, why do we have to talk about sex? And, you know, but for me, that's important, right? So, so it, it's important for me to be able to say that. And then my dad's like, you know, I can't wait to have my first same sex or same gender or non-binary whatever marriage. I can't wait to do that. You know what I mean? So it's like yeah. I've seen that. So when people are like, oh, you can't really grow or this is, you know, how I believe it's all, that's all bullshit. Like so so that's I, I guess, you know, I'm trying to even think about it, how it is with myself. But that's very important to me. And being at Union has made it even more so. You know, because at Union, you know, we have people from all walks of life, from all different, you know, faith traditions, et cetera, and beliefs. And how do I welcome everyone and how do we all feel like we belong in the same space? And it has been difficult, you know, and it's we I mess up all the time. But it's, you know, how do I keep growing to be able to share that with people to say, this is a safe space. Even if we mention Jesus, even if we mention Buddha, even if we mention nothing, it's a safe space. And how can we all inhabit it together? Knowing, like you were saying, and like, I really do believe we're all going to end in the same place, you know? And with this, like, I love when you were talking about energy, you know, earlier too. It's like, because I feel like that's probably what it is, what it feels like. It's just this beautiful, you know, for me, it would be like blue, all these blues, you know, there, like all these shades of blue and, you know, just this energy enveloping me just to feel loved, you know, and accepted exactly how naked, you know, where I could just go naked and I would not feel embarrassed. Well, I, su I suppose that sort of begs the question, what are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? Like... If, if that's what the definition of love is and being able to bring that level, that level of vulnerability, that amount of oneself to the table, what are we afraid of? Why are, why, why are we afraid of that? Why are we actively pushing back against that? If, big if, big if, if that is what we are made for, the experience of being loved fully and giving love fully. You know the thing, Polly, too, like those of us, you know, who who believe in the Bible, right, or read the Bible. Sure. I mean, come on. There's so much crap in there, too, that's like, like, you have to be beautiful to be loved. You know, you they fell in love with you. Awful, awful shit. Yeah, just, you know what I mean? So for me, that also... I think we're so afraid of rejection, you know, I mean, it's, you know, I see, I hear, especially younger people, how they feel ugly. And I, I'm like, you're so beautiful. Like, how can you feel ugly? 
You know what I mean? And and it's society has done that. Parents have done that. Family members, you know, people, just whatever. But how? When did we decide as a as a people to to and and I've done it too. I mean, I've done it. You know, to say you're not good enough and you are good enough. Like who? When? Because I feel we all do it, and then we do it to ourselves too. You know. I am, um, you know, I am diabetic. And so because I am diabetic or I'm fat and that's why I'm diabetic. And I, I'm so afraid, you know, I was afraid at one point, like if I told people I was diabetic, they would be, of course you are because you're fat. Or, you know, or that whole thing, like I cannot share. Sometimes I feel like, well, if I share what I'm eating, it's like, well, of course you're eating that because you're fat. You know what I mean? Things like that, that it's like I tell myself instead of like just enjoying my life, you know, just enjoying it. So and I hear that from people, you know, in this case, like when we're talking about fat people or fatness or fat phobia, I've actually heard people. I don't take pictures because I don't like looking at myself. I look fat. And yet I remember three different stories where they didn't take pictures with like a loved one who then died. And so they have no pictures because they were fat and they felt, you know, people are going to look at me a different way. And it's like, why? Like, how did that happen? You know? And so I feel like that happens with us in all senses, not just about body image, but about, you know, I, you know, I have saggy breasts. So, you know, if I'm with a man or a woman, are they going to like that? Or I have, you know, stinky feet or whatever, you know, whatever, like why, I don't know why we focus on these things that truly don't matter. And I think that it happens a lot in religious um, places in faith places where we constantly just look at the negative instead of the positive or the things that we have in common. And I think for me being raised male, the, the ra- being raised with the notion that it's not okay to be beautiful, that, that you're not supposed to be beautiful, that's not, something that, that's not something that's manly and you're not supposed to seek out. That like the... The, the the brand of toxic masculinity, Christian Christocentric toxic masculinity that, that I grew up with was you don't have time to think about beauty. You don't have time to to expand that a little bit more to think about the self and the value of the self when you have so many things to worry about, like being tough enough or figuring out how to provide for the family. Shove all that down deep and sort of set it aside so that you can focus on what really matters, which I, su- I suppose is being, finding one's place in the system f- so the system can figure out where you belong or don't. And yet Christianity is all about looks. It's all, you know what I mean? Like the Bible, again, let's go back to the Bible. We love our vestments in our church. Well, that, see, that's all <laughs> drag. I'm sorry, but that's all drag in the Episcopal Church. We all know that. I mean, it's like the longer, the showier, the bigger, the hatter. I mean, it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's like, I mean, I would be, if I were a drag queen, I'd be so excited to be able to use those vestments. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, but what I'm, you know, in the Bible, like when it talks about, Daniel, when it talks about David, when it talks about, you know, then uh, these women, you know, Esther, it talks about their beauty. So please do not even try to tell me that it's not important. You know, if it's actually important in the Bible, and that's why we know when it says um, God does not look at your outer, but your inside, you know, I feel that's so important. Yet then why do we have all of these examples of physical beauty you know i don't get it like those are the things that kind of anger me about the bible and or people or men who put their you know signatures on all those things i mean because i'm like how is that important you know and why don't we talk more about men in these things why can't a woman have like a month a bunch of concubinos you know i mean what what happened there but yeah so for me it's it's that you know it's like 
like you just said, why can't we just be like, you know, I, I have a little nine month old niece and, and although I think she's beautiful and gorgeous and just, you know, all these, you know, physical things. I also think she's super, super intelligent and just curious and good and, you know, happy and has an attitude and yeah. screams and, you know, all of those things that I hope that nobody takes away from her. Like, I hope that, yeah. that, you know, that our family can help her just be herself always, even when it's uncomfortable, you know, even when it's like, it, it, it makes me question, well, is she being a good girl? You know what I mean? Just, I hope that we don't do that to her because that's what we, that's what's been done to us. Yeah. You know, somewhere along the way, somebody said, what are you doing? You know, you can't have long hair. You know, like you're saying, you can't be beautiful. Why? By the way, I've always thought you were beautiful, just FYI. So. Oh, shucks. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, oh, look, the camera just cut out for a minute. And, <laughs> and, and you can't see how incredibly blushing I am right now. Wait, it, it, it didn't cut out? <laughs> All of that was on camera? <laughs> Got it. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> the Asian glow is in full effect right now. Right. Uh, uh, <laughs> Love it. <laughs> um, beauty. Spiritual beauty, but but also redefining the concept of what what physical beauty looks like. Um... Now, can I just say something there? So for me, okay, one of the things, like for me, I love beauty. What I find beautiful, yeah. right? And, you know, as I get older sometimes, I feel like I have to kind of put brakes on sometimes. Because I'm forever, I'm telling people like, oh my gosh, I love your hair. Oh my God, I love your eyes. Oh my God, they're so blue or they're so brown or, oh my gosh, your, you know, your arms are beautiful. I mean, I have been like that for a very long time. And now sometimes I feel like I don't want to, you know, put people off. Like I don't want to, you know, make people uncomfortable, you know, because, you know, all about consent, all about that. Right. And so now I... I put brakes on it. Plus, I also notice that when I'm with my Christian friends, they'll say shit like, um, is that really what you should be looking at? I'm like, why not? Like, I think it's, you know, like when people dress a certain way, I think that's amazing. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, it's nice to my eyes. It's nice to be able to see it. How is that bad? You know, so it's, and it's not necessarily like, oh my gosh, only this type of person. It's anything, you know, that I find attractive to me, right? To to just, or just attract, or when I can tell, like, for example, if you are wearing a certain thing that I can tell you're very happy with, yeah. my God, that looks beautiful on you. Or I love the way you carry that so well. You know, I don't see what is the big deal about giving people just that compliment or, you know, again, maybe sometimes it's like a little like, ooh, I love your arms or, you know, maybe not doing like that. right? But, <laughs> but you know, but well, it's you like... want to you want to pay a little bit more attention and see if like they're into it and then be like, right. And, and see if right. it can see if it can lead to, you know, what whatever. Like, yes. I mean, I just want everybody to know I'm single looking. OK, <laughs> I have a doctorate. No, but you know, well, that doesn't we'll always come back. Go. Yeah. We'll come back to that later, um, because because like, yes, you have a doctor, <laughs> but that's that's important, right? Because I I think what you're getting at there, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're getting at this notion of repression, and that there are a lot of doctrines in in Christianity, a lot of different ways of reading it. So that's nice, but also a lot of them pick and choose how much they want you to repress, and how much that is a part of the doctrine. And one of these doctrines is this language of purity and all of the ways that purity has impacted us. And what does it mean to be pure? There are the conversations even about how the language of purity culture it has its 
has its foundations in white supremacy as oh, well. Absolutely, of course. Yeah. Um, like 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 everything else that that has been designed to repress us. Am I right? I guess so. So so this is an important question about how much of Christian doctrine is about repression, and how much of Christian doctrine is about liberation. Right. So. I, I don't even know if there's a question in there, right? But just this observation that are the the things that we think that we believe in or we've been told are important to believe in have this profound impact not just on how we think but how we behave as well, right? Yeah, and and aren't we the children of the resurrection? So therefore, children of the light, children of liberation. To me, that's that's what makes me want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus because Jesus said, you know, it's like, you know, they think all of my followers are drunks and, you know, they don't wash their hands before they eat and they're this and that and the other. They cuss. And it's like, yeah. And they're my followers and I love them, you know, and I want to be with them. I want to just hang out with them. I don't want you to throw rocks at people because you think that they're doing something bad when I think they're doing normal things like all of y'all. You know, so for me, it's that is that liberation. We we need to stop trying to i can't, why am i so worried about you whatever it is that you do instead of being more not maybe not concerned i don't know what the word would be for you to find this love that i have found you know what i mean like when i go to this like amazing restaurant i'm going to tell you all about it i'm not going to care that you're Super skinny, super fat, super tall, super short. I don't care about anything else except this is an amazing restaurant. Let's go. Or you need to go. Or this is an amazing book. Go get it. Or this is, you know what I mean? Like, I want you to find the same thing that I have found that makes me happy, that gives me hope, that helps me wake up in the morning, that helps me be able to, you know, even through my tears, know that there is hope somewhere, somehow, some you know, way someday it will all be okay. I don't know how, but it will, you know, and I want you to know that too. I want you to know it will be okay. It sucks right now. It's awful. It's shitty. It's, you know, everything, but we have that faith that, you know, it'll be okay. So for me, that's, you know, I don't know, that's the liberation. That's the whole, like, that's what I want us all to know, you know, that it we don't have to be in shackles. I mean, isn't that what we say that Jesus came so that we can be free? Maybe there's the scary bit. For some of us, maybe we actually don't want to be free. But that's a that's a question, right? Because liberation is hard. Yep. Doing doing the uncomfortable work of of the self-examination of the, the squishy and vulnerable bits is profoundly uncomfortable. And I think, I suspect anyway, for some people who at least go to church on Sunday mornings, it's a much easier way to be to allow those things to go unexamined. Or, and it's not just a church, but any other thing where there's this idea of liberation and hope and a better, more honest to self way of living across all of the traditions that, that I could certainly imagine that have some sense of moral authority on, on the earth that it's easier to say, well, that sounds very, very great, but no, thank you. Not for me. So I, I wonder, I wonder if part of the reckoning that we're talking about, about what Jesus actually says, what Jesus asks of us and asks of Christian community is a reckoning and on perhaps an unnamed reckoning, but a reckoning nonetheless. Do we actually believe in the teachings of Jesus or not? 
and is it okay if or not is the answer for my community or for me? I think that's what we're getting at. Is that is that fair? I think yes and maybe even no. Because so one of the things that, you know, when I'm asked to talk to seminarians, right, um, especially in the Episcopal Church, one of the things that I will say is, all right, so you felt whatever, a calling, a vocation, whatever, to be a follower of Jesus and then to lead people to Jesus, right? In the Episcopal Church, in whatever denomination, but in a Christian tradition. So yes, let's ask all these questions. Yes, all this stuff. However, if I'm going to go to your church and you're a pastor and you're supposed to be leading me, again, I walked in the church, I see it's a Christian church, And then all of a sudden you're out there saying, you know what? Like, if I were up there saying, everybody just go anywhere and everything's going to be okay, fine. Except I'm here to teach you about Jesus, about how to follow this person as Christians, this Jesus, right? Again, if you're Buddhist, you're Buddhist. I feel like we're all going to the same place. However, if I'm going to like a music school, I want to learn about music, yeah. you know? So if I'm going to a, to an Episcopal church, I want to learn about Jesus, you know? So I want and to any Christian church. I want to learn about Jesus. So for me, I feel like that is important. So for seminary, I always say, if you are not about Jesus, this may not be your track. You know, this may not be the church for you. You know, this may not be the space for you. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, for me, it's like there are all of us can have a space anywhere. We have to believe that, you know, and also I think part of seminary would be I need to see, you know what, this is this Jesus thing is just not for me. Now, maybe it's this Episcopal thing is not for me. It could be that, you know, but I feel like if we are followers of Jesus and then I'm going to be a pastor to pastor others to Jesus I also need, even with my questionings, even with all that stuff, I need to also know I am following Jesus, the, like the, you know, the works of Jesus, um, you know, all that stuff. You know what I mean? So for me, that's, that's just the thing. Like, I don't, I feel like those of us who are in the world, you know, helping other people, you know, find love and be, you know, accepted is one thing. And it's another thing to be, I am a pastor, I'm a Christian pastor my responsibility is, in my opinion, to be, to help you learn about Jesus. If I am a follower of Jesus, you know, just like when I'm a math teacher, you know, even though I'm going to bring all of these other things for you to, you know, to help you learn, my responsibility is to teach you math, right? So, so that's anyway, that's how I see it. And, and again, you know, those are my little close minded, you know, little things that I have sometimes where it's like, you know, the, we, there's a vast, you know, there's vastness in this world and we can really do and be anything we want or we can. And so, yeah, so I, I, like I tell my, you know, seminarians, I want the people that are being formed to then teach me as a Christian to be followers of Jesus also. You know, because if I go into a Christian church, that's what I'm I'm hoping to get. I'm not hoping to get, you know, uh, more knowledge about something else. Otherwise, that's where I would go. Yeah. So, but again, that's my little, you know, that's where my open-mindedness, I guess, maybe comes into a little, I don't know. To be able to be open-minded requires a level of self-awareness, like to, to acknowledge right, who right, right. you are and what your traditions are. Because if, if we don't if we don't know the place that we begin from, then we can't know anything else. Yeah. Well, I look forward to the next time that we chat. Our, our last question for you is the one that we ask everybody as we're closing up. What do you want the world to look like when you're done with it? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a little bit better you know, a little bit better than, than it was when I, when I arrived. 
and and I just hope that because of my life, there's a ripple, you know, wherever. Like maybe a child that I knew when they were in pre-K, you know, when I taught, when I first started, or Ellis or Sophia or Sophia's kids, you know, somehow that it just continues this little, this little spark, you know? And so for me, it's like, I hope, I hope the earth and I are never done with each other, so. I hope not either. My thanks to my guest, Dr. Sandra Montez. You can follow her on Instagram at Sandra T. Montez. And the book, Becoming Real and Thriving in Ministry, is available wherever books are sold. Thank you so much for tuning in to Uncommon Good with Polly Reese. This program is produced in Southwest Philadelphia on the unceded land of the Lenny Lenape tribe and the Black Bottom community. Our associate producers are Willa Jaffe and Kia Watkins. If you enjoyed listening to the show, please support us by leaving us a five-star review and a comment and subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts. It really does help people find us. Uncommon Good is also available on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram at Uncommon Good Pod. Follow us there for closed caption video content and more goodies. We love, love, love questions and feedback. You can send us a DM on social media or an email at uncommongoodpod at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, wishing you every uncommon good to do your uncommon good to be the uncommon good. <laughs>